What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hartness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Shoba Shandran, and we speak about co-facilitation. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, just scroll down to the show notes to find the link to download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy the show. Shoba, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes, I'm excited to hear more about your journey and about co-facilitation. And before we get there, I always like to start with the same question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? Yes, okay. So for me, I think I will answer that in two parts. The first part is from a commercial perspective. So, you know, after I decided to to go out and do my own thing, right? Start my own business. So from a commercial perspective, I started to call myself a facilitator fairly early on. So early 2000s. But I think if I were to give you a deeper or possibly more meaningful answer, I think I felt I earned that maybe 10 years, after 10 more years of practice mm-hmm. to say, yes, yes, I facilitate and I'm a facilitator. That's what made the shift? I think, you know, when you start out, you know, there is the saying, ignorance is bliss and you don't know what you don't know. So, you know, you can call yourself anything, which I did. But I think after a while, as, as I got deeper and deeper into, you know, facilitation, like many other skill sets can be considered just a skill set it can be considered a practice if you go deeper, a philosophy, a way of being, etc. Mm. So I think for me, as I started to appreciate what that means, I, I truly started to understand it really at a more deep level. I think then I feel like I earned that right after 10 years of practice. So, so that's, that's why I'm making that distinction. Thank you for sharing that. And um, I like how you highlight all the different aspects of facilitation. And I truly believe that it's more of a life skill at the Mm. end of the day that everyone can, must learn. But then facilitation as a profession is something different. And I find it interesting that you, that these 10 years were just growing into the practice and not just getting certificates. I think Mm. that's an interesting fact. Mm. 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 Because I think for some, they then start calling themselves facilitators once they got the stamp and their their certificate. Yes, yes. Well, like I said, I called myself one very quickly too. But, you know, it's it's different, right? Yeah. Yeah. But if you've really earned it, yeah. And before you started your solo business as Mm. a facilitator, you're already Mm -hmm. facilitated. Yes, starting to, yes. Yes, and I uh, remember that in our exploration call, Mm -hmm. you shared a story where you worked at the Ministry of Defense. Yes. Enabling innovation. Yes. And I would love you to share the story because Mm. I think it's fascinating to hear how, how with the skills of a facilitator, you can enable a culture of innovation Mm. within an organization that is usually, I think considered as a command and control environment. Mm, mm, yes. Yeah, that, and that's a great story. And, and I think, you know, much respect to the, the Singapore government, they have been very, very forward-looking on quite a number uh, of areas. And so this, you know, we have to rewind time really back to the really early 2000s. Uh, my journey started specifically in 2002, but they, they had started the, the promoting the idea, you know, you must innovate, you must innovate. And the what is interesting about the Singapore government is that they do have a very strong influence on both the government sector as well as the private sector. Mm. Uh, um, so, so this this sort of you know you must innovate for sure. Uh, the government sector picked up the you know the baton so to speak and said, okay, so we need to innovate. What does that mean for us? So I give you a quick backstory to that. So they they did set up headcount to fill people to uh, uh, so specifically within the Ministry of Defence to put together a team of professionals that would drive innovation efforts within the ministry itself. So when we were put together, we, we were new. We were new. Innovation as a, 
uh, commercial discipline was new to mm-hmm. Singapore. Globally, it was not new, but for Singapore, it's definitely new uh, at that time. So one of the questions we had to ask ourselves is, what is our role in the Ministry of Defence? You know, our purpose. And as we, you know, grew to understand, it really was to help the ministry evolve. To be fair to the to the Ministry of Defence, at that time already, you are right to say that, yes, the, there is an element of command and control because they are a military organisation. Uh, but at the same time, they were evolving, they were transforming already. So our role, I think, was really to accelerate and support that transformation. So to look out into the world uh, to see what is out there, you know, that we can bring in tools, techniques, uh, processes, methodologies that would help accelerate that. And, mm. and innovation as a, uh, sorry, not just innovation, but uh, facilitation as a practice, as a skill set was something that we, in a sense, discovered uh, uh, that we, and, and then we realized we wanted to bring in uh, to the military to accelerate the transformation efforts. What aspects of facilitation then was that? Mm. So how did yeah. you spread this skill set and mindset? Mm, mm. Great question. So the idea was, you know, one of the things that we that that our team was very, very mindful mindful of was the fact that we, uh, apart from uh, our team leader who's male, the rest of us just happen to not be, right? So, so we don't have military training. And so we were asking ourselves the genuine question, who are we to go to a unit, a military unit, and tell them how to run their business, tell them how to innovate? So when we came across uh, facilitation as a practice, as a skill set, you know, and we're starting to understand it, um, you know, our, our basic understanding at the time was, you know, facilitation is essentially creating the right environment for people to have good conversations and, and to allow them to figure things out for themselves in a safe space, in a protected space where we provide a strong process and they come in with the content. So that's that's mm-hmm. really where, you know, we started and we said, yeah, I think this is a great practice for us to adopt. Yeah. I find this fascinating. And mm. allow me one more question. Please, um, please. So how did you facilitate this shift in perspective? This, mm. Mm. How did you break the command and control? Or maybe you didn't have to. Yeah. yeah. I think, like, like I said, to be fair, um, when we were speaking with the, the unit commanders and the leaders, there was an element of hierarchy and respect for rank. But I never... I never sense, and this is me being female, not being part of the, the, the military culture. I never did national service as, as, a, as a female. All males have to do that in Singapore. So I never, I never felt that. I felt that the, the leaders were very open to ideas. And so how facilitation as a practice came in is when we were working at the unit level. So imagine that we were sort of like internal consultants. Like you imagine a consulting unit, commercially, you go to your different organizations, you sell mm-hmm. them something, right? So we were doing internal selling around innovation and using. So what we did was we built the workshops in such a way where, you know, they were not mini lectures, you know, so a lot of old school style training is very mini uh, lecture style. So they were, they were designed to be very, very facilitative from the point we engaged the leadership, right? So it's not, let us tell you how amazing we are. Let us tell you what to do. It is, Tell us what your issue is. So, so really adopting the facilitation principles, you know, at the start, what we now call sponsor engagement to say, what is your issue? How can we help? And then sort of trying to design something that would help them. And every workshop that we would offer them subsequently was designed in a facilitative style. I hope that helps. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. So what were your key learnings as a facilitator from this period? So many. Okay, let me think. (laughs) Well, you know, speaking of uh, linking to possibly our main topic for today about the power of co-facilitation, actually, Mm -hmm. one one of them was that because naturally, because we worked as a team, we did not work alone. So that's one thing. The other thing I think that, that stood out really strongly for me was that mindset shift between the the more traditional, I'm coming in as a subject matter expert, let me tell you. So the more advocacy style, I tell you, versus the more inquiry style, which is more facilitative process facilitation to say, let me ask you rather than me telling you. So I think that for, for us, 
the internal consultants, as well as the people we were providing the services to was a big shift because for them, they, there was also an element of tell us. Mm. Uh, so they said, no, we cannot tell you because we do not know your business the way you know your business. So I thought that was quite a, a lovely whole evolution from both the service provider, us, mm. as well as the client in, in sort of dealing with this new thing called a facilitation. Yeah, I like that, how you phrase it, from the tell us to ask us. Ask right? us. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. And I can imagine that this then slowly changes the entire culture or brings a new facet into the culture of hierarchy, command and control to inquiry. Yes, yes. So at, at the time, again, like I said, at, at the time, they were already, the, the ministry was already very much into the learning organization. Mm. Uh, as a as a philosophy and a uh, um, also a, a culture, so what we were doing was accelerating that, yeah, yeah. accelerating the adoption of that. Beautiful. Mm. As you mentioned, the co facilitation aspect, the teamwork yep. aspect of this project. Yep. Mm. What does co facilitation or teamwork in the facilitation process mean to you? Because mm. I realized that when we say co-facilitation, we often mean different things that can yes. be either someone just being in charge of the logistics and mm, yes. the tech hosting <laughs> in these days, but back in the days, maybe doing the flip charts or a graphic exactly. recorder or someone who co-designs with you. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so so I will share with you my definition and then we'll take it from there because I do have, again, certain distinctions and then yeah. you pick up and see what's, what's most interesting for you. So one of the things that myself and my associate, somebody that I do co-facilitate and work with a lot, we started to define it because there was also a commercial element to that. So we started to define, you know, what is the role of a facilitator or in the running of the workshop, what are the various roles mm. that need to be played? So obviously, one of the roles is just logistics support. And in Singapore, we don't have someone that does that so much purely, simply because against a commercial decision, you have to pay that. So normally, the facilitators <laughs> do that. So, so let's, let's talk about the, the actual facilitation. So at the basic level, what we, we have something what we call a support facilitator. So a support facilitator is also known as a small group facilitator. So this person is probably less skilled, less experienced. And what they're doing is when teams very typically, because you know, in, in workshops, it's you can have a decent size. Anything 16 and up, we say possibly we will break them up into smaller groups at certain points in time. So when they break up into smaller groups, sometimes we have uh, support facilitators or small group facilitators to go in and work with the teams. Mm -hmm. So that is a small group facilitator. And then the next level up is what we would call a, a co-facilitator. So a, a co-facilitator is somebody that will take some of the space uh, to use, you know, the face-to-face -face term, front of room facilitation. So mm -hmm. they will take some of that, that space, that time. So very typically, if you share that, anything between 40 to 60%, we would call that person a co-facilitator. Mm -hmm. If, for example, I am leading 70% of the time, I would probably say I am the lead. The other person may be a co-facilitator, but you know th that is actually a very interesting transition point. So to me, a co-facilitator is somebody that shares some of the, the front of room time and may mm -hmm. also be working with the small groups. And the lead, obviously, is the person that you know will lead a lot of the sessions and also is probably in charge of being the client interface. Mm. So most probably the one who got the lead Possibly. and then invites some, someone. Do you have, you mentioned that you, you mentioned one co-facilitator, one colleague of you. Yes. Would you always work as a team with the same person or would you switch and shift depending on the project you're working on? It depends on the project. Yeah. So, so with, with this person that I have been working with for 15 years, we absolutely love each other. We are best friends uh, and co-facilitator. We work on strategic planning sessions together. We work on very facilitated discussions together. But his background is not in innovation. 
Mm-hmm. So when I run more innovation type workshops, then I work with other facilitators that have an innovation background. So yeah, so it is in that cases, sometimes it has to be subject matter expert related. Yeah. Interesting. And how would you choose or how do you find a co-facilitator? What are the characteristics? Because let me give you some context. I yep. can imagine, as you just said, One aspect can be subject matter expertise. So someone yep. who's highly skilled in yep. innovation or in strategy or in brainstorming yep. or whatsoever. Another aspect could also be personality. Someone yep. who compliments you, yep. who might be the bad cop yep. Yep. <laughs> or the good cop. <laughs> yes. Yes. So what are, the, what are the aspects that you would consider? Okay. So I use two terms. One is what we call attitude mm-hmm. and the other one is aptitude. So mm-hmm. aptitude obviously is the, the subject matter expertise, the domain expertise. Do Sometimes we need it to be complementary. That means not exactly the same. Sometimes we, we need it to be a little bit more uh, uh, similar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when, when I first mentioned that, uh, yeah, the, the subject matter expertise and, and how experienced they are as well. So that is what I would call aptitude. So obviously depending on the nature of a project, how complex it is, what skill sets they need, then that is the, the aptitude components. Mm-hmm. But the attitude components, I would honestly say, is much more important, <laughs> much more important yeah. than, than knowledge and, and, and skill set. Yeah, so attitude is much more important uh, around that. So when you say attitude, mm. what comes to your mind and what makes it so important? Yes. So again, you know, because it's, it's an A and an A, right? A- aptitude and attitude, it's like, oh, it sounds nice. Uh, um, so attitude to me contains, and an, it's, it's an umbrella term that contains, like you mentioned, personality to me. It is their value system. It is a person's way of working. It is, you know, how they regard themselves, how they regard others, how good a team player they are. There's so many things that come into attitude. and. For me, I I learned this a long, long time ago. Attitude to me is way, way, way more important than aptitude anytime. I would much rather work with somebody that was less skilled in any way, shape or form and had a good attitude versus somebody that was uh, highly skilled, but maybe the attitude was not so so positive, not so great. (laughs) And I can perfectly relate to that because it's... Mm. I mean, it's highly stressful in the preparation, but also Mm. at the day. So you have to work closely as a team. And I think especially when you're in the room together and you're you're confronted to group dynamics and Mm. you have to facilitate on your feet. Exactly. (laughs) Because usually the agenda will never work out as we've planned it. And then there are these moments where you just need to understand each other without many words. So I like to take that a little bit further. Oh, yes, sorry. Please. No, no, please, please, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so what you mentioned was in session, but for me, you know, the partnership happens way before. Mm. Uh, because uh, especially with more complex projects, uh, there is the client. En- so there's a client engagement process and there's a co-design process. So that sort of, you know, ability to dance together well, the attitude comes in way before you run the session. And, and these things are actually, I find, very, very important. You know, it is a willingness, for example, in the client engagement, right at the start, before you've designed even a willingness to say, okay, you know, let's come in. If it's a more complex project, let's come in together. But we need to chat before also. We need to align ourselves. We need to norm just between, you know, ourselves, how we want to work together. And then how do we approach the clients, you know, What, how, how do we present a unified front? And then in the co-design process after that, how do we co-design together well? And then delivery. It's only then you get, you know, how do we deliver together well? Yeah. Very true. Very true. And the co-design, I think if you work well with a co-facilitator or any peer in this co-design process, it is just so much faster to design an agenda And you have these yes and games. Mm. Almost. Yes. Oh, I yes. Agree. And do, let's do this. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. let's add that so that it's much faster and also much more effective, I think. Yes. I, I would admit that sometimes it gets slower and sometimes it can be quite 
hair pulling, even with people that I work with well and know well. But mm. I, I don't have an issue with that because for me, if we know that uh, we, we have normed and our values are aligned, the process can slow down. But I know ultimately that we will create a superior product. And that is what is more important. I'm actually okay with something that can potentially take longer. Sometimes it is faster, but sometimes it can take longer. And this is maybe also where the complementary then comes in. Mm. So someone who sees aspects and has a different perspective that you might argue ab yes. about, but then at least you have discussed it and considered it. Yes. yes. So, so what are some of the glitches that come to your mind when aligning or co-designing with a with a colleague? So, so sometimes there are very practical things like time commitment. Mm. Uh, one of the things that I also have learned to appreciate over time is with client engagement. Again, I qualify with more complex projects. With simpler projects, sometimes you can just have one person, but with more complex projects, especially with strategic planning, you know, retreats, I find that it is valuable for two people to go in and talk to the client. But even then, there is, to me, even with every mini engagement like that, there is a pre and a post. So there is a, okay, what are we going to talk to the client about? What are some questions we want to ask them? And then we go talk to the client. And after that, there's time to say, okay, you know, how was that conversation? What do you think? What was the energy? Where's the client going? Do you think we can uh, work on this together? Is what we're offering, what they need, et cetera, et cetera. So, The time commitment, I think a lot of people may not be consciously aware that there is a lot of time that is committed to doing something like this. So sometimes I think there may be a little bit of friction because people may not be aware that actually, you know, that there's all these things that are involved in doing that. Mm. And then, of course, in the design process, which may take longer than expected and then putting things together as well. So I think time is one, one thing I would say that, uh, that may cause a little bit of friction. Mm -hmm. which I think Miriam is, is one of the reasons why, uh, again, one of the things that I appreciate that I've learned over time is sort of scraping my knee, you know, sort of having that, that sometimes difficult situations is I do norm now with my, my co-facilitator before we start on a project so that we both have a sense of what our working style is, what our values are to minimize any of these things, you know, once, once the project starts. I love that. And let me ask you how you do that, because in my imagination, now that I heard it, it almost sounds like a mini workshop between the two of you. So do you have a process or a template that you would use, or is it something that is, comes natural through a conversation? Ah, okay. So I'm going, to cheat. I'm going to say a little bit of both. <laughs> so it, it is a facilitated conversation. So for me, normally what I say is, you know, typically speaking, I will have a norming conversation after the project is confirmed that we know that project is going ahead and then we've agreed, okay, we're going to work on it. And so I will tell them, I will say, hey, I would like to set up a norming conversation with you where I want to understand your style. This obviously is on assumption that this is a very, very new person or mm -hmm. that maybe we work together once or twice. So very important, especially if it's the first time. So I will set up with them and let them know that it is going to be a norming conversation. So I will send them a few questions to think about. So in, in our conversation, I am going to share with you a few things. May I invite you to think about these things as well? Could you so give I, some examples? Of course, I figured you were going to ask. <laughs> I'm so, so predictable. Yes. No, no, no. I'm, I think it's a fair, fair thing. People would be curious to know what do you want to talk about in a, in a norming conversation. So, so one is, again, very practical things about communication frequency, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. So meaning to say, is it okay to message after hours? Is it okay? So I just invite them to think about it in advance. On, on the weekends, I also want to ask them uh, um, what their style is like when they're facilitating, when they're running meetings, etc. Also things like even setting up meetings that I tell them, you know, uh, uh, invite them to think about how they want me to set meetings up with them. Because for me, I live and die by my calendar. If it doesn't exist in my calendar, it doesn't exist Guilty. in my life. <laughs> so, and so also what their co-facilitation style is like. Yeah. So, mm. this, uh, I, so I send them a few things just to invite them to think about it. 
And then when we have that conversation, normally I will share first because sometimes people don't know what I'm talking about. So I will share to say, you know, you can WhatsApp me anytime. You can email me anytime. But if, if, if I feel like I'm really mentally exhausted, I will let them know and say, I'm really tired. Let's pick this up on another day. So I won't ignore messages, but I will let people know, you know, so that's an example of, of, of a norming, part of a norming conversation I will have with someone. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think mm. it's really, really helpful. Mm. Has it ever happened to you that after a norming or during a norming conversation, you realized, oh, we are not aligned. This is not going to work. I need to find someone else. Very typically during a norming conversation. No, mm -hmm. because people are normally quite excited. This is sort of like almost the first date or the, you know, the job <laughs> interview. Almost, where people are like, yeah, sure, everything's fine. <laughs> so, so, so typically, no. So how I try and hit that off, I think, is the good thing is, you know, in, in any industry, if you've been in it long enough, you start to get to know the community. And even if you do not, you may know people who know them. Mm -hmm. So normally what I try to do to hit that off is if I know of the person, let's say I don't know them personally, I've never worked with them before, I will try and find out if we have any co-facilitators, trainers in common, and I may ask them if I know that they've worked with them together just to understand, get a sense of their working style. So I try and uh, uh, anticipate that in advance. But yeah, during the normal conversation, <laughs> normally people are like, yeah, sure, that's everything's all good. Yeah. <laughs> A simple deck of cards can be a brilliant way to engage a group. You can use them to stimulate thought, inject energy or spark lively conversations. But how can you use cards when you're facilitating virtually? Deckhive.com is a brand new platform that enables you to use cards on screen just as you would face to face. Invite people to a shared real time session and then let them select, move and flip cards over. Our growing library includes many popular card decks, including picture cards, strengths cards, emotion cards, and more. But if we don't have what you need, you can even create your own deck really easily. Use the code WORKSHOPSWORK when you subscribe to a paid monthly plan, and you'll get the first month completely free. Go to deckhive.com and give it a try. Often when we think of team dynamics, hmm. after the norming, then there comes the excitement, and then there comes the storming. Yes. Is this something yes. that also happens with co-facilitators in such a constellation? Yeah. I think, you know, in, in all the, the years that I have done it, and so this is, again, with me being more experienced, I think I look back at the time when I was less experienced, I say, well, I myself was less experienced, so, you know, I, I, I probably had a lot of maybe dysfunctional behaviors myself over time I've managed that. I think there's only one or two that stand out for me that, that, didn't work well and that, that I walked away a little bit disappointed with the, the co-facilitation. But generally speaking, I find it has worked. Mm -hmm. Would a story help I, uh, that uh, in a time where it didn't work so well? If you feel comfortable sharing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't name names, so it's all good. <laughs> I think one, one that stands out for me was it was one particular project where this was actually an associate won the project. And so this was one of those rare times where I was the lead, but not mm -hmm. the one that won the project. So an associate won the project. Uh, he handed it uh, to me to, to lead. And I said, that's, that's great. And so I went to look for somebody that I worked with some time ago. Right. And then, you know, what happens? The cardinal rule. I did not norm with them. See, there you go. <laughs> Mistake number one that I made because it had been a very long time that we had worked together. Uh, so I did not norm with them. And, and so one of the things that, you know, happens as, as we know, client says, okay, we want this date and, and they had booked the date, but they said, look, we cannot confirm until very much closer. I mean, it's quite unfortunately, you know, it happens. Mm -hmm. And so when the client finally confirmed uh, the date, the co-facilitator uh, said to me, oh, I'm sorry, I, I can't do one of those dates because I'm committed for something else. And so this was actually quite upsetting to both myself and, and my teammate who won the project because, you know, he had sent the reminder several times, look, hold the date, hold the date, please. And why that upset me was because what that meant is for this particular workshop, what that essentially it needed two people. That, that, is, that was a given. 
so what we would need to do is to have like sort of myself and person A, facilitator A, and then on the second day, myself and facilitator B to come mm-hmm. on board because my teammate, the one who won the project, could not be there because otherwise we would we would have just said, look, you know, we'll take over. And we asked a few people uh, to see whether they could do both days, but we could not because it was it was relatively close to the date already. So, you know, that really created some issues because to be fair to the client, you know, we wanted continuity for the project. Yeah, to, to be fair to them. And also to be fair to myself being the lead facilitator, it would mean that I would have to onboard two facilitators and also make sure that the facilitator that was joining on day two was, you know, as comfortable as if they were there on day one equivalent. And briefed. Yeah, yes, they need exactly. to have all the information. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so that to me was really not a positive thing. But to be fair, you know, sometimes these things happen and you, you overlook it. And then I also mentioned, oh, by the way, you know, on day two, because this, this lady was actually going to be there on day two, not day one. So day one was, was my, my teammate. So on day two, you know, we, we said, okay, you know, it, it was off the cuff. And I said, you know, just, just remember that we're, we're going to do a debrief after. And then she said, oh, you know, uh, but I have something on after that. And so again, I said, you know, that was the second strike was, okay, this is, unfortunately, we're done. I don't think we can ever work together again because neither of us is a new facilitator. We all know, you, we all know you always do a briefing and you always do a debriefing. So I, I was really, so this to me was an attitude issue. Uh, yeah. It was not skill set because she was brought on board because of her skill set. So I, you know, it w- it was quite disappointing because I liked her and I wanted to work with her again. Mm. But this is not somebody that I would work with again because of that. Yeah, unfortunately. And thank you for sharing that. Mm. I think we we learn almost most from from these experiences. And what mm. I hear are two things. One is never skip the norming. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And be a, be aware of timings and and these kind of communication to align. Yeah. yeah. And the other one that I hear is the importance of this to be aware of the responsibility that we are carrying. So yes. when yes. we facilitate, we are there, we're in service of the group. Absolutely. And then this must be the priority. And then if we shuffle it in between other commitments and don't make time for briefing and debriefing it's as if we are letting the group down absolutely absolutely yeah very interesting thank you for saying that that was beautifully beautifully summarized (laughs) (laughs) and you mentioned your early days as a facilitator where Mm. you would um, rather join as a co-facilitator to support someone else and i recently launched a survey Mm where I asked um, facilitators about their weights, about pricing, all these kind of things. And yes, one aspect, <laughs> yes, very, very interesting results, yes. I must say. And one aspect was co-facilitation. Mm. And what I found striking, maybe not so striking, because if I look in the mirror, I was the same, that mm-hmm. the early days facilitators work mostly by themselves. Mm. And I wonder whether where this comes from and would be curious about your perspective, because I can see two reasons or two ways to look at it. One is confidence. So when I'm a young facilitator and I just want a client, maybe I don't want to expose my insecurities or I better do it by myself. And the other one I can imagine is that in the early days when we self-select to become facilitators, freelancers or solo solopreneurs Mm. maybe we see ourselves as these lone wolves and not Mm. as team players Mm. but maybe you have a different perspective Mm. Mm. so i will speak based on my experience in singapore around that and so what is interesting is so facilitation as a practice again as a practice philosophy etc in Singapore, by now it's not new, but when it you know started to come into Singapore, relatively speaking, it is much newer compared to where you are in Europe, and definitely much much newer compared to the U the US. Oh yes. Oh, yes. So, what I thought was 
it ha- what happened in Singapore was really lovely. It was the peop- the pioneers. They were trying to start a community of facilitators from the start, actually. Mm-hmm. And so the people that started to do facilitator training in Singapore, so they tried they, they, they try to create communities of practice. And so when they got projects, they tried to give opportunity to newer facilitators. I was one of them. And I also did a, a, a lot of work for free, right? So I would work with them and I was more than happy to do that. And this was really, I would say, is not exploitation because the market at the time, uh, there were projects when we could be paid, we were paid. And when the market could not bear it, the, the commercial, because it was a small project, it was, you know, my senior facility, my seniors were, were quite upfront about it. So I would go and do projects for free and I was more than happy to do that. So the training. I, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. I find that my experience here, you know, because I was here when, when facilitation sort of uh, uh, as a practice started to grow. And I, I know the people that really, you know, we can say brought it into Singapore, so to speak. I, I, I think here, many of us appreciated the opportunity to work with the seniors mm-hmm. and the seniors gave us opportunities uh, to do so. So I think here it is actually quite different. I think many of us did have the chance to learn with others from others, actually. Yeah. So would this then mean that in Singapore you have more of a culture of co-facilitation? I would say... If you grow up um, with it? Mm, okay, I would say yes, but I caveat that. So two things. One is, does the project from a commercial perspective allow for that? Mm. People will do it. People will. And I think many of us, myself included, because we were so appreciative of what was, in a sense, the opportunities that were afforded to us, were given to us, we want to give that to others. So for me, in my work, I try and do the same myself. Right. So if there are opportunities where, let's say, the project is simpler or the budget is smaller, so I can't pay somebody, I may pay them like, for example, $100. This is just to cover transport, etc. Mm-hmm. Right. To say, look, this is for you to learn, for you to observe, for you to be do maybe small group facilitation. And I give opportunities to other people. And whenever possible, when the project can bear it, I will get a co-facilitator. Actually, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. What would be your advice to a early early days facilitator? How mm. to approach co-facilitation or the first project in general? So do you mean from a skill like a skill set perspective or, or Yeah, someone who just started calling themselves facilitator. Okay. Who okay. might who might be timid to reach out to a co-facilitator or don't know why they would need it. Mm. What would be your mm, advice? Mm, mm, mm. Okay, okay. Well, so I think <laughs> the advice would be look for opportunities. I would say be hungry because our, you know, our profession, similar to pretty much every other profession, I think, really is about portfolio, right? It is about what work have you done? And when you're new, that is very, very tough. So if a person is comes into the space and they're in an organization where maybe they have co-trainers or co-facilitators, then I would say just go ask. Ask and look for those opportunities and ask for somebody to co-facilitate with you. So if, if you're in an organization, right? Because then there isn't the issue of, of uh, will the market bear it? There's, there's no talk of money, thankfully, right? But if they're on their own, they're started out, then I would say get connected to communities because there are communities all around the world now, right? There, there are facilitator communities so go and find out. And very often, like especially what happens in Singapore, there are people that train and right? there are trainer, 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 facilitator mm-hmm. program. And a lot of these organizations do actually have communities themselves because they know that people starting out do need help, do need support. So go reach out to them and manage your own ego. Yeah, just swallow your pride and ask for help. I think I would say yeah. that's how I would say. And, and you'd be surprised, I think, at the willingness for the community to step out and, and help people. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm building myself a community of facilitators who's never done before. Yeah. And the willingness to support each other and to be there and to learn from and with each other is just amazing. Mm-hmm. And I think it's maybe also in our nature as facilitators. We're giving so much to these groups. 
so that if we find our own crowd, it comes natural. Yeah. Just to share with you, Miriam, I started out a, a Facebook group. It's called Virtual Facilitation for Trainers, Facilitators and Speakers. Mm -hmm. And it's really to share tips, tricks, ideas, or oh, if you're a facilitator or a trainer, especially because it was more recent in the virtual space, right? Yeah. Come onto the Facebook group, just type in your challenge, the, the community you know, will come in to help you. So, so there are definitely communities that are there that are, that are willing to, and I think it's just finding them. Yeah. Yeah. It's just one, one email or one post away. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I agree. And what is your experience or opinion regarding co-facilitating with someone from the client side? Mm. How interesting. A little bit scary. I would say. <laughs> What makes and, you and say the, that? Mm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so the reason for, for that is one of the advantages we know of being a third party is neutrality, right? Mm -hmm. we, we don't have an agenda. We're not, we're not going to push anything for the organization. We have a role, you know, we talk to the client, we say, what are your objectives? And, and that's what we go, we go after. So the, it is very challenging for a person that is working within an organization to be neutral unless they are very, very skilled themselves. And to be fair, there are, uh, but what I have found is that that level of neutrality in organization, it is just tough. It is just yeah. tough. So I would say scary in that sense because unintentionally they might drive the conversation in a certain way. Yeah. And, and, and you know, participants are very smart. They pick that up very quickly, yes. very easily. So yeah, that's why I said a little bit scary. And I love the way how you frame the concept of neutrality, because neutrality can be an entire conversation, separate mm. conversation. Mm -hmm. but the way how I understand you use the term means the absence of an agenda or the absence of a specific desired outcome. Yes. So again, we have to qualify that because, you know, part of the running a workshop is you get clarity on the outcome, which by default we, we know it is supposed to be neutral, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it is to, to achieve an organizational goal or a team goal, but not a specific solution. Yes. Yeah. And yes. a client might be intentional or unintentionally driving a specific solution yeah. that they might want. Yeah. Very good point. Thank you. In your experience, what makes a workshop fail? Mm. Well, That is pretty much what will make a workshop fail, actually. Mm -hmm. I came across the term many years ago. It was introduced to me. It is called fascipulation. You may or may not have heard of it. Mm -hmm. Facilitation plus manipulation <laughs> equals fascipulation. <laughs> so this is when you are pretending to be neutral and pretending to facilitate, but you're actually manipulating because you want a specific outcome or you want a, a specific uh, a solution. So what I have found, and this is something I do look out for, especially at the start when you're engaging with clients, are they really committed to a, of course, there will be workshop objectives, but do they want a specific outcome and they want to pretend that they're having a conversation, but at the end, everyone should land at the outcome. So that's one of the workshop. Oh, yes. that's mm -hmm. one of the things I'm always looking out for. And I'm very, very careful about that because I know that is what will make a workshop fail. That mm. to me would be my number one thing. And I have actually walked away from projects when, uh, and, but to be fair, there are very few and far between, but I've walked away from projects when I sense that because I am fortunate in the sense that I run my own business so I can make those kinds of decisions. I go, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Which is also a question of integrity, right? Yeah. As a, yeah. as a facilitator, if, We walk into the room with basically the promise that every voice is, is heard and yep. everyone can contribute to the solution. Mm. And then we're breaking this promise by if we know that there's a hidden agenda or a predefined yeah. outcome. Yeah. Yeah. And you said um, you walked away when you sensed that. Mm. Is it something that is always to be sensed or... Is it always sometimes maybe also just outspoken by the client that they would say, okay, we need a workshop and this is 
we need this outcome. Please ah, yes. help okay. us with that. Yes. Please facilitate that for us, not for the group, for us. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, my style is I am a sensing person, so that, that just creeps into my language. So yes, sometimes it is very, very clearly stated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so yes, when I said sense, I mean, yeah, when I sense it, or when it is clearly stated. Okay. And sometimes it is clearly quite clearly stated, actually, yes. So And maybe you have one or two hints. So what are the the red flags we can look out for? Mm, great question. You know, when I hear things like, we would like you to send this message. <laughs> so that, that's, a, that's a big red flag. And so normally I try and, You know, there have been times, to be fair to clients, they may not be aware that mm. they are manipulating. And sometimes people can be invited to see a different option. So, you know, when, when they say something like that, we would like this message to be sent. You know, I give them the, the permission to say, you know, in a workshop, you can say in some situations, this section is non-negotiable, mm-hmm. right? And there's nothing wrong with that to say, for example, the strategic direction or the strategic pillars have been decided on, right? That's okay to say that. But how we get there, that's open for discussion. So sometimes you can help a client see that it is okay to put some non-negotiables up and then to frame the conversation around those are the negotiables, right? Mm. That's okay. But sometimes when you present that to them, but then they still come back to you and sort of say, no, no, we want to have a conversation about these things. But, you know, we want everybody to, in the end, still agree with what we want to go. And, and, and then I go, oh, no, no. <laughs> that is definitely a manipulation happening or facipulation happening. So, no, yeah, that's a no for me. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I think that's yeah. very helpful just to be aware. Yeah. I hope that clarifies things. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you have a favorite exercise? So if I may answer that in a slightly different way, because I don't, but I do have something that I do like to do at the start of workshops. Mm-hmm. So, you know, at the start of workshop, one of the things that we very typically do when we open session, obviously we have the agenda, we're setting the context and the whys. You know, check-ins or icebreakers are a very typical or standard part of that. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to do what I call purposeful icebreakers or purposeful uh, check-ins. Mm-hmm. So why I introduce the word purposeful, it is relating to the purpose of the workshop. So it's not just an icebreaker. It's not just a neutral check-in, but I try and design it in such a way that it links to the purpose and the objectives of the workshops. I can mm-hmm. give you an example if that yes, helps? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. We love so, examples. Yes. All right. So, so there was one workshop that I was facilitating. So this client, they own and operate buildings, mm-hmm. right? And these buildings are spread out geographically speaking. So, so it, it's a, a big country and so different, different parts of, of uh, the country, different parts of the state. So this particular workshop, we were coming together to discuss these buildings, some of which are new, right? So they're newer, some more modern, etc. Some of these buildings, which are sort of medium age, they're still okay. And some of them, which were older. Mm-hmm. And the purpose of the workshop was actually to look at these buildings and to say, should we, you know, continue to operate these buildings in this particular area with other things in mind. Obviously, one of them obviously was the age of the building itself. The other thing is population trends. Are people moving in, moving out? Mm -hmm. What is the potential client uh, usage, right? So all these things being involved. And of course, the human element, because if you close anything down, then staff that are working there will be impacted. So from a client perspective, they'll be impacted. From a staff perspective, they'll be impacted. So for this particular check-in, so I I said, okay, so for this particular check-in, what you're all going to do is to find one person, right? So they they were working in pairs. And so with this one person, what you're going to do is you're going to share with them what your first house growing up looked like, okay? So that is part one. Mm -hmm. Part two is, let's say tomorrow you had to, or, or tomorrow you were deciding to move back into your childhood home. What would you do with that home? Would you leave it as it is because it's beautiful, brings back beautiful memories. Would you do some sort of minor renovation or would you say, oh my God, it's awful. 
Let it, we need a total, you know, we need to tear it down and rebuild. Or would you not move in at all? Okay, so obviously when we did that, they shared the story, people got very excited. And there was the reason why I framed it that way, your childhood home, because I wanted them to look at it from an emotive point of view, not mm -hmm. just an objective point of view, right? So when people share, blah, blah, blah. And then I linked it to the purpose of the watch. I say, you know, today we're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. So when we make those decisions, please remember the human elements, you know, that, that if we decide to close something down, that, that there will be a human impact to this. Yeah. So, so people, I think people like that. <laughs> That's a, uh, that I, yeah. I love it. I love it on so many levels. Because as you said, the childhood memory also creates excitement and emotions. So it creates this bond and curiosity. Mm. We expose our private side. So it makes us a little bit more vulnerable. Yes. yes. And yep. it's meaningful. Yep. Yeah. So that's what I mean by a purposeful, purposeful. icebreaker or purposeful check-in. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, Very welcome. inspiring. Thank you. Mm. Since we're approaching the end mm. and you have shared so many nuggets, mm. but is there anything that is on your mind that you would like to share with the audience that we haven't touched upon yet? I think if, if, if I may close with this, you know, if sometimes it serves repeating even to myself, I would say as, as facilitators, I think it is an important practice to eat our own medicine. Mm -hmm. If we say that we should open sessions well, we should norm, we should do check-ins, etc. We should do that with our co-facilitators as well. Like the little check-in we did right at the start of our conversation, right? Just check in with each other. Or if you're going to work together, norm, right? We shouldn't just be doing it to other people, doing it to other teams. If we truly see the value of it, we should be doing it to ourselves as well. I think that's, that's what I like to, you know leave us with wonderful which is the answer to the question that i usually ask is mm -hmm. if someone missed the show and doesn't have time to listen to the entire conversation <laughs> what would you like them to remember so i think I, that was a beautiful answer that to be, that yeah that would be it pretty much yeah thank you so much for your time and for your openness to share your experience Mutual. i really enjoyed it And I will put um, your contact details in the show notes. So whoever wants to reach out, connect, learn more with or from you or hire you, they will find you. Perfect. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. It was you. a lovely conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, Please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.